Hey y'all, Carolina Tony, thank you for stopping by my channel. If you're here for the first time, be sure to go down below and please subscribe if you will. After that, ring the bell so you'll be notified every time we put a video out. Today, our adventure brings us to the great state of Tennessee and behind me is Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. And we are going to go inside and explore and learn a little bit about what went on inside of this penitentiary way over a hundred years right after this station identification dangerous sense 1896. Brushy Mountain first opened its wooden doors in 1896. In 1934, the wood was replaced by stone by the prisoners. And for 113 years, this was, was Tennessee's only maximum security prison. They say the loud clanging and the first gate closing could be heard in the nearby town of Petros. More often than not, it signified the last breath of freedom of the new brushy inmate was ever going to take. After surrendering his personal belonging, the inmates were given an ID number and a standard issue prison jumpsuit. From this gate over to this gate, was called central control. This is where everything was handed over. And after you pass through this gate, that was all she wrote. This was a holding cell for female prisoners that were either going to a court or being transferred to another prison. And this was a cell block. Shower. In the early days, all the floors were dirt. Then they were replaced with pine planking, eventually concrete. Okay. Some of the prisoners here worked in mines, timber, and some were stuck here. But in 1931, this prison held 976 inmates, more than 300, and it was licensed to do. There's a photograph of the Brushy Mountain coal mine where some of the prisoners worked. Just a hundred feet from the prison. There's something that happened here three times a day. It was called the count. It's when the prison guards walked along the cells accounting for every inmate. This was called a draw bar. It was actually outside of the cell block itself. It would open the top part and opened, and opened the cells, where each cell had to be opened by a key. So with the bar down, even if you had a key, you couldn't get out. There were some pretty tough criminals here called monsters. This one of these cells right behind me housed someone called the Zoo Man. Zoo Man Husky Mendenhall. He was a long haul trucker from Indiana and he was known for preying on red headed prostitutes at truck stops across the U.S. 
and he was suspected in the unsolved red-headed murders. Convicted of two murders and plotting to pay $15,000 to federal to fellow inmates to kill witnesses on the outside. Another famous inmate here at Brushy Mountain was James Earl Ray. He was the most infamous inf inmate here for killing Martin Luther King Jr. James Earl Ray, this was his home for many years. Cell Block 28. He initially pled guilty, and then after that he recanted, claiming to be a patsy of a government conspiracy. Despite several escape, escape attempts, one of which led to a massive FBI hunt in 1977, earned him dreaded D-block isolation, and years was added to his sentence. Once stabbed 22 times by four black inmates, he managed to survive. While suffering from liver disease in Nashville Correctional Hospital, Ray promised Dr. King's son he was innocent shortly before he died in April 1998. And there's no evidence that proved him not guilty. This is an escape ladder that James Earl Ray used in 1977 to try to escape. made from half-inch galvanized pipe. And here are some of the cell blocks on the second floor. Each cell block had a mailbox where the prisoners could send out letters to home or to send out a grievance that they had a problem here. Everything from prison food to the state of work and the living conditions. And this is the cafeteria on the second level. Three times a day, every cell door opened, an entire block, and the guards marched 200 inmates, single file, to the cafeteria for a time to surround his 60-acre working farm, which included livestock, butcher, house, crops, fields, and dairy barn, provided all the food for the prison. And the inmates not only cooked for fellow convicts, but they also for the prison employees. We have to remember these were deadly prisoners. And some of them cut in line, only to find out when getting cut in line, you get hit in the head with a hammer. Sometimes the cooks would retaliate by using the kitchen utensils to slice off an arm of an inmate that had disrespected them. James Slagle, in 1970, just a few years into his 318-year sentence for kidnapping and murder, he was looking for a way out of prison in a box. Since large containers never left Bushy, Slagle studied yoga for nearly a year and learned to masterfully contort his small body. With the help of kitchen co-workers, he squeezed into an 18 by 9 inch box, taped together, labeled 150 three pounds of roast beef and it was put on a flatbed truck. Once on the highway, he used his shoulders to burst open the box and he tumbled off the truck into freedom. Unfortunately for Slaggle, he had been spotted by an off-duty prison guard out rabbit hunting and he was soon back in brushy facing time in the hole. Imagine a human being fitting in an 18 by nine inch box. It's unreal. Sometimes when the prisoners were in the cafeteria, things would get pretty violent. This is where a lot of them would be together for the first time and the only time. Things would get bad, fights would break out, and in this bulletproof glass with a hole, 
when a riot would start, two guards aiming the rifles through the glass holes with an intent to kill. This is known as D-block. The maximum capacity is 25. In 1957, D-block was used as an isolation cell for prisoners that are most difficult and deadly criminals. In 1960, the D-block was known as the New Hole. In the maximum security D-block, the prisoners had nothing. Over on the regular block sales, they could have a few personal items, but the maximum security had nothing. Sometimes, not only bad behavior would get you put in maximum security, but if someone was to put a threat on your life, they'd put you in here for your own protection. Now in this prison, they do allow people to come in sometimes at night to do paranormal investigations. And there are some areas that are considered hot spots. Uh, in maximum security section, this would probably be one of them. There's the draw bar that would open the pris prisoner cells. Your food through this little hole and then clang it shut. Apparently the inmate that spent a lot of time here was a race car fan. This is the laundry room. In the 1950s and 60s, the residents of Petros could bring their garments here to be laundered free of charge. The laundry room was a place where prisoners could easily hide contraband once a 25 caliber automatic pistol was discovered here. And even though they were not supplied anything to make weapons with, the prisoners, ingenious that they are, the prisoners somehow managed to fashion knives and all types of things to use as shanks. This is a 38 caliber zip gun, a 22 zip gun. homemade tattoo machine. They even made dice to gamble with. A bar of soap, a bar of soap carved out to hide contraband. And even a Bible cut out to hide contraband. This was the exercise yard for D-Block. Prisoners would come through this door. They're in solitary confinement with their hands and their feet shackled. Once they got out to this section, their feet were unshackled. They stepped into the exercise yard, put their hands through the hole there to have their hands unshackled so they could exercise. And it looks like perhaps there were a punching bag down here so they could beat on it because they were so mean they had to beat on something so they wouldn't explode internally. Guard towers, the guards would enter them by a ladder. And once they reached the top, they would pull the ladder up behind them to keep the prisoners from get them in the event a riot broke out. This is the commissary window where prisoners would come to buy personal items such as shampoo, candy, cigarettes, instant coffee. And it's also another interesting thing is that Donald Kaler, he was one of the six inmates who jumped the wall with James Earl Ray in 1977. 
how Kinder did it is he was 130 pounds, five foot six. He put on a prisoner uniform that he swiped from the laundry and went through the window. Once on the other side, he sat down in a chair wearing a pair of shades, pretending to read a newspaper and slipped out through the main door at shift change only to be recognized by another guard. He got sent to the hole and extra time in the slammer. This is the inside of the gym. And they would have boxing matches and of course basketball and other things in here and even riots. Because anytime the prisoners got together, good things were not bound to happen. This was known as the yard where the prisoners would get to come out sometimes and just hang out. Today, they actually have events here, such as concerts. This is a new maximum security prison that was built right behind it. But you're not allowed to go in there. That was the former guards residence. And that was minimum, minimum security, which is outside of the prison walls. Okay, well that's going to end our tour of the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary. I hope you enjoyed it. As you can see, this is not a place that you want to end up. Again, thank you for joining me. If you like this video, be sure to give me a big old thumbs up. Be sure to share with your family and friends. This is the way it sounded back in my day. Okay. He's in James O'Ray's old cell. But until next time, y'all have a good day.